Um, hi everyone, um, welcome to today's Galaxy and Cosmology seminar. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Aaron Young. Aaron is doing currently his PhD at Rutgers University, but actually he spends most of uh, his time in New York at the CCA. And he does his PhD with Rachel Somerville and works on SEMA analytical models. He's in particular interested to use these models um, to predict the high redshift galaxy population. With high redshift, I mean everything above redshift 4, and he tells me he's very interested you know, out to redshift of 15, which we currently cannot really observe, but um, if you know, the upcoming um, telescopes, such as JWST, as well as the Ocean Space Telescopes, um, we hopefully will get a glimpse on, on these galaxies at these high redshifts. And, and so he's really, uh, I think, a key player on these analytical models uh, in, in making predictions, in particular for JWST. Um, and so this is also what he will be talking about. So take it away. Thank you, Sandra. So basically, you gave my entire talk already, right? So um, I've been doing this for my entire thesis. It's called the, uh, I market my work under the umbrella of semi analytic forecast for JWST. But you get to know a little more about the, the marketing part later. But um, I'm a grad student right now, officially at Rutgers, but I spend all my time at the CCA. So if you visit Rutgers, you can actually can find me there. And this work is done in collaboration with the people listed there, with a few more will be mentioned later. Okay, so the, in the, the motivation of this project, um, well, there are very, well, a lot of reasons why we love to study high redshift galaxies, but i just give you the, the one that kicked me started. So um, we know the universe is ionized, but only with the guys that observed, it, observed it today, there aren't enough ionizing photons to reionize the universe. So maybe the faint guy has have done it, but right now with the current in instruments, the uh, uncertainties down there is pretty high, and it's hard to observe faint galaxies. So there are models that study those, but still we're looking forward to more observational constraints that tell us exactly how many galaxies are there and what their properties are like. And of course, this is a very exciting time to study high redshift galaxies, because James Webb is launching, especially when I was starting this project. James Webb was supposed to be launched this year, and now it's still launching very soon. And of course, I get questions a lot uh, you know, about what happens if anything happens to J James Webb. But you know, of course, now I get my backup plans. I'll show you later. All right, so let me justify the semi-analytic the semi-analytic part in the model. Why do we go semi-analytic? So for simulators like myself, we always face this very real problem. Given a fixed set of computational power, you kind of have to justify or, do, uh, or design your simulation in a way to distribute the power, either to simulate a big volume and to get the large scale structure right, or s s dedicate most of your resources to simulate you know, individual galaxies to get the details that you want. But either way, you can't get both. You can't really get both, because this computational power needed scales very rapidly with simulation sizes and durations. So for cosmological simulations, like you know, uh, the millennium simulation, it's hard to get details. It doesn't have baryonic physics in there. And for idealized galaxy simulations, which you get all the detail, but if you try to do tens of thousands of galaxies on them, they can get really expensive, too. So. Um, and the other thing is, none of these simulations have enough of the resolution to get down to the physics, the real bit of physics. For example, um, star formation, feedback, limitations are everywhere. Not saying the same is the best solution to this, but it offers an alternative to modeling large uh, population of galaxies in the cosmological context. So how does it operate? So the SAM itself is just, or the semi-analytic model itself, is a set of carefully curated physical recipes. So for example, we have things like uh, accretion of hot gas and how they cool, and then we trace um, star formation or we partition the cold gas into different phases. We also have different feedback mechanisms like star formation, uh, supernova feedback and AGN and stuff like that. And also, of course, physical parameters that exist in all the simulations these days. And they're only calibrated once it's at redshift zero, and then we don't touch them anymore. And then, we run them down these dark matter halo merger trees, which are basically dark matter halo merger histories. They can either be extracted from n volume simulations or constructed using extended press structure formalism. But either way, we go down the merger histories and predict how galaxies form and in evolve inside this dark matter halo and get a bunch of physical properties predicted at, at a relatively low cost. And of course, we can also forward model them into these observables, a wide range of observables. For example, we have the rest frame UV luminosity. We also have observers frame infrared magnitude for all the JWST wide, uh, new cam uh, wideband filters. So this is great because we can 
easily cover galaxies over a wide mass range. We can sample things in halos that goes down to the atomic cooling limit all the way up to some reasonably massive things that you can expect at high redshift, which is kind of hard for a conventional numerical method. And also, um, this method is so efficient. I can sample millions of halos on a laptop like this overnight. And it's so efficient in a way that I can even rerun the model multiple times and experiment with the physics. I can change one physical parameter at a time and see how would that affect you know, the uh, predicted physical properties. So um, this is great because illustrious simulation takes about nine months to run each, each round. So it would be hard for those kind of simulations to do this kind of experiment. But of course, as I said, the SAM is not the perfect way to model things. There are some limitations. As your former colleague, my current colleague, John Ford, would describe the SAM, is that um, these are essentially 0D models. So the SAM does not really spatially resolve everything. The properties inside a galaxy are treated as a reservoir. So we track how much hot gas, cold gas are in there, how much get turned into stars at each time step, but we don't get to, say, the spatial distribution of gas and stars and things like that. So just keep that in mind. All right. So at first glance, let me show you some promising predictions. So um, here are the calibration plots at redshift zero. So we basically, at this point, tune the physical parameters such that these predictions match observations at redshift zero. So there are a few things that we care the most about. For example, the stellar to halo mass ratio. We have the gas fraction. We have the um, black hole to bulge mass relation. We also have um, stellar metallicity, things like that. So these are the, it's the only time that I tune the parameters. And I don't do that again at high redshift because that's not how things work. You know? It's not very helpful that you have to retune the parameters at every redshift. If we do that, we're just making elephants that we want. But it's very exciting that out of the box, these predictions can reproduce the observed evolution at redshift 4 to 8 for the stellar mass function, and also similarly for star formation rate function, and also the UV luminosity function. Of course, we have to assume some dust in there. So the dashed line is without dust, and then the solid line is the luminosity function after accounting for dust attenuation. But this is already very promising or even exciting in the first place. You know, I don't have to do too much work to make it work. It kind of works out of the box with the physics that we learned from the local universe. And the real question is, how good are they producing predictions for galaxies that we don't see? Or are they even valid, these predictions? Right. So matching everything is never the goal for this project, right? Because you know, there are many ways to make it work. If, if we're just looking for things to match, we can just throw it into a machine learning black box and say things match. But really, we, we care about what can we learn from these simulations or this result. So let me just give you a quick example. Of course, I can experiment with many other physical you know, recipes. So what you're looking at here is the mass outflow um, that scales with um, the circular velocity with some power law, and the power itself is the alpha RH, stands for alpha reheat. And this basically characterizes how efficiently is mass getting pushed away from a halo, depending on the, gra uh, the gravitational well depth. And of course, if I make feedback stronger, then it heavily regulates star formation, and it suppresses the formation of Star, uh, star formation in low-mass halo. And as a result of that, you produce fewer low-mass galaxies and with a shallower luminosity function faint end. And the opposite is, if I make feedback weaker, then it's easier to make more low-mass galaxies and the, feedback, uh, the, the luminosity uh, faint end slope becomes steeper. So this is interesting because um, I also want to point out that currently, with current uh, observations, there are disagreement between these observational constraints. Really, we're pushing down to the limits of, the, uh, of Hubble. And uh, there are a lot of um, things that go into modeling assumptions for these observers. And there's no consensus so far. And I'm preparing the set of predictions that can later be uh, used uh, to, to, well, later GWST will produce new observational constraints to tell us how these, um, well, how different physical recipes might evolve over time. So what I'm trying to say is this recipe itself is very simple, actually, if you can see. And there's no explicit redshift dependence. But maybe there are things that we didn't capture. And effectively, this relation evolves as a function of redshift. So now I do this parameter cranking thing and see what happens at different redshift. But when newer observational constraints come in, then I can revamp the model. And of course, this is the uh, forecast for JWST series. So I have to do something with JWST. So um, this is the same stellar mass function you just looked at. 
and the, uh, the vertical line there marks the detection limit of a typical GWST wide survey. Everything to the left is too faint to be seen, and everything below the horizontal line will be just too rare to be expected in the survey. Of course, we might find them as galaxies are highly clustered at high risk shifts, but you know, let's not expect to find them in a typical survey. And I do that the same thing for deep and lens survey by you know, subsampling my own prediction, predicted galaxies to make this mock luminosity, uh, mock stellar mass function for different GWST surveys. And you can see that already uh, with GWST, we can easily, well, it can easily go down to deeper and deeper, well, fainter magnitudes or lower stellar mass and probe the faint end slope. And this is really exciting me somehow. And the other thing I want to highlight is we really do need different types of survey to fully sample the stellar mass function in the future. All right. And of course, stellar mass function is only one of the examples that, of, of the many things that we predict. And I just dumped everything I predicted into this corner plot and stare, for it, stare at it for hours, because it's just interesting, I think. Um, the vertical and horizontal lines there mark the detection limit of uh, typical JWST wide and deep survey. Everything to the upper right quadrant can, is expected to be seen in you know, such corresponding survey. But um, do you want to also highlight, um, well, first, this kind of plot, um, I made this for a wide, uh, full redshift range from redshift 4 to 10. And you can check out the full version in the online archive or the published version of this article. Um, that row there, I call the observer's row, because if you're an observer trying to plan an observation, and given some detection limits, you can quickly estimate what physical properties you should expect for these galaxies. And also, we have the simulators column. Let's say you have all the computational power you want, but you can only simulate one halo. Then which one should you do? Then you can quickly estimate, use that column, to see what physical properties you would expect for those simulated galaxies. All right, so to show you everything I do with galaxies, and let's switch gears a little bit, because this is actually how my thesis started. Are these galaxies able to reionize the universe? And one way to go for it, go about it, is to ask how many ionizing photons are these galaxies producing? And there are three parts of this answer, the three parts answer to this question. First, how many galaxies are there? What are the abundance of these galaxies? And that's the first part, which I just talked about. I made those predictions for the luminosity function. The second part is how efficient are these galaxies at producing ionizing photons? And of course, the last part, which is also the messiest part, is the escape fraction, because there's still no good constraints on how it works. But well, bear with me. But for now, let's just look at this factor, psi ion. So it's effic effic effectively a conversion factor that go from some UV density or SFR density to the number of ionizing photons produced per you know, UV. So in the past studies, especially the theoretical ones, the analytic ones, they used this fixed number, 25, with a log psi ion equal 25, or plus or minus something, for um, the study. But the plot there is really messy, but it shows you that it, this factor effectively evolved as a function of both metallicity, stellar mass, or even the assumptions that go into your uh, SPS model, the syn uh, stellar, uh, simple st uh, synthetic stellar population models, things like that. So it's actually 25 is not a good representation for uh, uh, this quantity. So what I do is I implemented a recipe basically counting the number of ionizing photons produced by these galaxies. See, the SAM itself is very efficient, and we already have predicted stellar population inside the galaxies that accounts for both the metallicity and age. So it is, for, in one sense, a free ride on the, the work that Rachel has already done in the past 20 years. But for me, it's just easy that I can just grab whatever stellar population predicted by the SAM and add this recipe to count ionizing photons based on the, uh, the stellar population within. And we can already see that. So it's a messy plot, and you can already tell that I have a special uh, passion in multiplying the plots. But um, just to uh, help you digest this a little bit, so um, the columns are organized by redshift, and to the right is higher redshift, and the three different rows are for different SPS models. So there are two takeaways here. This quantity do evolve as a function of redshift even very mildly. It does. So higher redshift galaxies, they're younger, they're more metal poor, and they can produce more ionizing photons. And there is a mass dependence. So if we find that uh, low mass galaxies are more efficient at producing ionizing photons, at least per stellar mass or per luminosity. Of course, they are much fainter, but there are a lot more of them. So there's the degeneracy there. And the third thing is, it depends on the modeling assumption that goes into these SPS models. Um, it can actually make a huge difference, especially with b pass when binary stars account for or not. They can differ up to a factor of two, obviously. OK. But that aside, now I can 
use a very simple realization model to quickly forecast how the universe is ionized you know, based on these galaxy populations. So um, this, is a, this is a comparison between a constant psi ion that been, has been adopted in the past and a B-pass binary model that's you know, producing the most ionizing photons, the most optimistic model in terms of productivity of ionizing photons. And you can already see that there makes a difference. And with the same philosophy of how I do galaxy model, I can also easily tune the parameters a little bit. And here I think I reiterate when feedback changes. When feedback is weaker and there are more galaxies, what happens? And when feedback, if feedback is stronger, with less galaxy, what happens? So we now can predict a range of predictions based on the uh, different galaxy formation physics. And next, of course, we have the messy part of the model, the escape fraction. So this is just an example to demonstrate that, yes, um, so what's shown here is assuming uh, escape fraction of a 5% to, I think, 50%. I might have read it, written it wrong, but it's actually 80%. But the point here is the uh, productivity of ionizing photons responds much stronger with the escape fraction, at least in this context, rather than the faint and slope of the luminosity function. So this is one of the experiments I can do. So I know the three parts that I just mentioned earlier in this talk are very degenerate, but hopefully they, because they are affected by different physics and they can evolve over time differently, and I can tell them apart with this modeling frame framework. And of course, um, the tagline is we can go from reionizing the universe, uh, sorry, go from making galaxies to reionizing the universe in eight hours, which is pretty awesome. So we can now tune the physics in galaxy models and study how that will affect the large scale structure, well, observables predicted. And on the right here, I show that the evolution of the neutral volume and also the Thomson scattering optical depth under dif these different scenarios. All right, and of course, I can dump this all into MCMC and find out the optim optimal combination that um, would yield results that match observational constraints the, the best. But the takeaway point here is really we have this framework that is ready for future observations. We can quickly understand what it tells us when new JWST observations comes in. And of course, the MCMC is a ni nice addition, but at this point, that is not fully physical, actually. Okay. And ultimately, because of the wide and dynamic range that's covered with our model, I can answer questions like, how much ionizing photons are coming from galaxies that we can see? So here, let's say with a JWST uh, lens survey, now we can say, it, these galaxies observed in this kind of survey are responsible for up to 80% of ionizing photons at redshift 8. That's a claim. And also, what galaxies are doing the heavy lifting, are producing the ionizing photons needed to reionize the universe? And I show that, um, the guys who are doing the heavy lifting are not the guys that are uh, the most massive ones because, yes, they are good at producing ionizing photons, but they're also very rare at high redshift. So it's actually the next to the brightest group that, can, that are doing the heavy lifting. And these are the galaxies that we'll be able to um, observe with JWST. Okay, so it's been a little dense, but I'm going to switch gears a little bit again and tell you about the practical application for this work which I don't get to always say this as a theorist. I'll also show a nice picture. So um, using the predictions I made, I'm working with the um, JWST Cosmic Air Evolution Early Release Science Team, also known as SEERS, and I'm producing these ga galaxy catalogs to, uh, for the team to make these mock observations that will eventually go into the development of the pipeline for the actual real observations. So this is the groundwork that has been done. All right, so um, I'm excited for this. Hopefully it works. Yay. <laughs> So this is a mock image for the uh, JVST ERS team uh, observation, which is the old EGS field, except now with galaxies that are far fainter than the HST limit. So these are the galaxies predicted with my SAM, and using the uh, physical properties of these galaxies, we're matching them with the original illustrious TN, uh, original illustrious simulated galaxy, uh, the spatially resolved images. And then um, the color are coming from the predicted uh, observer's band, uh, observer's frame uh, near cam uh, future magnitudes, basically. So the colors are coming from the same predictions as well. And I just really like the an animation. And I don't always get to show a nice picture as a simulator. That's the same person, actually. All right, but back to the question. What happens if anything goes wrong with JWST? Of course, even though nothing goes wrong with JWST, I can do this following. Because this galaxy, 
are not for JWST. JWST just happened to be the instrument that coming up next thing you can see these galaxies. But I can, of course, easily adapt these uh, modeling pipeline to future telescopes as well. Especially at this time, we have a line of exciting telescopes that are about to come online or will come online very soon. But um, before that, uh, let me just quickly pluck my proposed postdoc project, which is supposed to be my thesis. It's called Samurai. It's, you know, it's called Semi-Analytic Model, which ultra-high redshift astrophysical interplay. So I'm interested in making all these predictions for high redshift galaxies. But we know the model doesn't include some essential pieces of the, picture, uh, of the puzzle. For example, we don't have pop three stars, and we don't have uh, proper seating for the black hole at high redshift. So with this umbrella project, the first thing I really hope to do is to study the coevolution of uh, the first star and the black holes and see how would these affect the galaxy population at high redshift. And of course, as an umbrella project, I can keep adding stuff to the project, uh, to, the, to the model enterprise and keep expanding it to add stuff to make high redshift galaxies predicted by the same more robust. And yeah, okay. And of course, we're also paving the way to all these multi-instrument surveys, for example, the uh, photometric detection with different instruments in the future. And this is a stellar mass function at redshift 10, and I'm trying to show you that we really need all of these instruments to fully sample the stellar mass function at this redshift. And with the same, I can easily do that for different instruments. This is including also LSST. Not very helpful at redshift 10, but um, it's, I'm looking forward to all of these telescopes. And the other thing we can do is um, try to do multi-tracer surveys with different instruments. For example, now we have the uh, JWST coming up online, and then ALMA will face an upgrade soon. ALMA will be able to see emission from molecular gas. And JWST, of course, with other instruments, will be able to see uh, emission from stars. And we can now probe different aspects of the galaxy, especially at high redshift. And other things I do, um, we're also preparing for um, the multi-tracer line intensity mapping coming up. I'm working with a team of Exclaim. And um, it's, it's a team that um, trying to put together some pipeline to do future CO and C plus intensity mapping. And on the right, I'm showing you that um, there's work to be done for the Sears spectroscopic surveys as well. So we're implementing both uh, emission from molecular gas and also uh, nebula emission. All right, so today you have seen exciting predictions from the SAM and the modeling pipeline that can be easily adapted to future telescopes. And hopefully, with Samurai, I'm very, looking for, very much looking forward to it. We were able to um, put more physical pr uh, uh, processes to the model and make more robust predictions at high redshift. All right, thank you for your time. Right, so um, that is purposely avoided in this project because um, Rachel experimented with a lot. So AGM feedback does a lot um, to the bright galaxies, the massive galaxies, but um, it's actually essential for uh, having the evolution correct to match the, uh, uh, the evolution of the galaxy populations in low redshift. But I do find that uh, beyond redshift four, turning the AGM feedback on and off doesn't really affect the galaxy uh, population as much. We think it's due to immature AGN and stuff. So they're just not doing as much. So in your uh, simulatic model, um, what are the different sort of modes of uh, gas cooling that you have? And do you find that they're sort of equally important for the formation of the first galaxy? Right. I think right now we only have the good old metal cooling. And of course, that's one thing we have to go, go in and investigate more at high redshift, because um, there, we know some of the recipes break down a little bit at extreme environments, extremely met metal poor environments. Yeah. But right now we just have metal cooling. Yes? Um, how, how much do the AGN contribute to the reionization? Right. So everything you saw today is only from starlight from galaxies. And of course, um, two weeks ago at Yale, I think people reminded me that there are more and more observations on obscure AGN these days, which I'm actually looking forward maybe with. Uh, with Samurai, I can do more realistic predictions for AGN and high redshift. But for now, the takeaway is um, without the contribution of AGN, with galaxies only, we can still produce the needed amount of ionizing photons to reionize the universe while matching both the, um, all the IGM and Lyman Alpha Force constraints.
not yet. That's a uh, possible future direction that I would love to take my project to. But right now, these galaxies are all coming from um, the extended pressure and merger trees, which are independent of the volume itself. Right. Right. I've not looked at this specifically, but I think that would be an interesting thing to put in the realization project. Because from that point on, I kind of did actually drop all the JWST limits. But yes, it would be interesting to see within the JWST limit, how good can we do? Yes. What do you think did you assume for the escape fractions when you went through you know, predicting the number of bands and photons? I mean, you had like a band, but it seems like the number of bands and photons is quite high. So right. Kind of yes. So for now, the traditional one model, the, the first thing I show, I should say out loud, is the 20%. So only with a fixed 20%, we can already match a lot of constraints for now. But um, of course, in the future, we will see what the evolution is required, or how would that actually depend on the galaxy property itself, instead of using this artificial population average escape fraction. Right. Any last questions? Okay, let's thank Aaron again. Thank you.